us. And we react based on what we're told. We, we, we sort of just want to go with the flow because it seems like the right thing to do. But ultimately, Lord, we want your perspective. And so as we dive into this, uh, this particular aspect of looking at this idea of what's happening now, and even really what's happened in the past, but what's happening now and how it's going to unfold and get us to the right thing. We have this tendency that you know very well, Lord, to look at the here and now. But all of these things, since the day you walked this planet, even before that, it was all about your kingdom. And so, Lord, the previews that we're going to be talking about are talking about the kingdom, not about what's the, the, the things in the world uh, that we're going to look at, because those things ultimately are steps that must take place before the kingdom comes. And so open our eyes, Lord. Give us understanding. As we talk about these things, uh, it can be a bit overwhelming, a bit confusing. So, Lord, we're going to ask you to just speak to our hearts that we may see with clarity, because you're not a God of confusion, that we might be able to see with clarity the things that you have laid out for us nearly 3,000 years ago, even beyond that. But that's, pretty, that's about as far as we'll be going here tonight. So we're going to give you this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so having said that, um, I don't know if you guys uh, saw or not today. At 11 o'clock, I was in the office. I, I am subscribed to, uh, uh, to many of the uh, news channels uh, that come out of Israel. Uh, and uh, so I get those little pop-up things, whatever you want to call it. So uh, at 11 o'clock this morning, of course, is about 7 o'clock at night there, and they just went on the news uh, they're roughly eight hours. I think they are actually eight hours ahead of us. Um, but at that time, there was a huge development that happened um, down in the south with this whole idea of Hamas. We're going to be talking about that more next week than we are this week. Um, but just so that you know, in Hebrew, the word Hamas means violence. Now, I'm not saying that's what it means in Arabic because I don't know. But it is interesting that Hamas, violence, uh, and, of course, we've all seen them as a major player um, in these developments in the Middle East over the past couple of few decades, actually. But uh, what ended up happening, I don't know if you've been catching glimpses of it or if you're aware of it, uh, but they have been taking helium-filled balloons, um, putting, you know, six, seven of them, whatever it is, uh, and then attaching uh, an improvised uh, uh, ordinance, an explosive device, to the bottom of that, and then they've been waiting for the wind to let these things go and blow up from, uh, uh, from the Gaza Strip and blow across the border into the nation of Israel, hoping that they're, of course, going to land in neighborhoods and on businesses and stuff like that. So far, no one has been, I mean, they've literally sent hundreds of these things. This is not just, gee, let's just try this. They're constantly, the videos have this whole room where they've got all these balloons stuck to the roof and they've got like six of them strung together and they put the, uh, the explosive device on there and they send it off. Sometimes they're like Molotov cocktails. There's all sorts of different things that they're doing. Well, they've been landing in Israel, but they haven't been hitting anything except landing in the fields and starting fires. And so nobody has been hurt. The damage has been minimal. But in response to that, Israel has warned them, as they always do, so they've gone in and attacked them. Just today, um, Hamas went and made an extended threat that they are, are, of course, like they always do, threatening to cross the border, to which, of course, Israel says, that's not a good idea. So this just happened today. Uh, and so the, as it popped up on my, my screen, what it was is uh, that, uh, that there, there are serious talks from 11 o'clock today, which would have been 7 o'clock uh, uh, their time tonight, well, about right now, as a matter of fact, um, that uh, the threat of war of Israel actually going into that area is like really severe. There's nothing, wouldn't surprise me at all if we woke up in the morning and find out that Israel has gone in there. So real quick, like I just wanted to show you, what we're doing now is we're looking at this, and this is how we announced this, uh, previews of, now notice this, it's not a coming attraction, it's the coming attraction. 
And as I said, the, the coming attraction is the Lord coming back. Okay? All the rest of this stuff are just steps that are going to take place leading up to his return. Okay? Now, it isn't that God said, I'm going to want this war and I want this war and I want these things to happen before Messiah comes back. All God did was tell us before how messed up man is in the, in the heart of man and being God who knows the end from the beginning. Remember, we looked at that verse. I think we looked at that verse. We're going to see it again on Sunday in Isaiah 46, where God says, I am God and there are no others before me. And I am the one that declares the end. Okay, that's where we are from the beginning. So what he's telling us is not stuff that he's laid out. But he's told us the direction mankind will take because it rejects him. Because there are those out there who say, well, how can you worship a God that sets up the kind of things that is happening to me? Obviously, if this is happening, this is his fault. Ultimately, no, it's not. It's the nature of man. It's just the way that it is. And so we need to make sure that we understand that. So what these things are doing, God has just told us, this is the path, this is the direction that mankind will take that lead to and are the reason that Messiah returns to earth, okay? So don't get mixed up, all right? We're going to be talking about some of these verses and going to show you on this. So when we move to the next map here, just in case you don't know, um, this, of course, is a map of Israel. And I wanted to show you, you can see all of the orange spots there, um, and this will identify for you uh, when you hear all these names, if you're not familiar with them, so now that you will know, you can see way up on the north there, or I'm up on the top, sorry, on the right-hand side, you see Syria, and then you see that little orange kind of, it's kind of lighter there, it's not as clear there. That's what's called the Golan Heights. Now that's a mountain range, now keep that in mind, mountain range, that's huge where we're headed. Okay? But there's a mountainous range that runs through there that in 1967, in the war, the Six-Day War, Israel, who was attacked from that area by the Syrians and by the Lebanese, they were able to push them back, and they established that Golan Heights as a border, as a, as a defensive position against both Lebanon and Syria, okay? So that's what the Golan Heights is all about. If you come down, you see in the middle there, you see the largest portion of that, that is the West Bank. But although it's on the east side of Israel, what it means is this is the western stop for the nation of Jordan. And they got this back also in 1967 in the Six-Day War as they pushed Jordan. Because remember, in 67, they were attacked from all directions by Egypt, by Syria, by Jordan, by Lebanon. Um, we could go on and on. And that's what all of these places are for, okay? That's why they exist today. These are zones where Israel said, this is where we have to stop them. So the Golan Heights there with Syria and Lebanon, the West Bank, for Jordan, and then you can see right at the uh, Mediterranean Sea there on the left at the bottom of Israel. That one's kind of red, I, it looks like, for, at least on my screen. Um, but that's what's called the Gaza Strip. That was established in the Six Day War because this is where Egypt inter whoops, entered into Israel trying to, of course, defeat Israel. All of these areas contain mountains. They're mountain ranges, right? So if you control mountaintops, right, even when I was in the military, this is what we understood, you know, you get the high ground, all right, because it's very difficult for an enemy to come. So these all have to do with mountains. So it is down there, um, uh, not necessarily the Gaza Strip, but down here in Jordan, you see Aqaba down there and Eliyad, that's where the balloons are coming in from Hamas, who is in the southern part of Jordan. Now, don't worry about all of these names because next week we are going to clearly identify them 
who they were as God from God's perspective, well, who they are from God's perspective, and then who they are as we understand things today. So in the south down there, in that very the bottom area there, you can see the Gulf of Aqaba. That is where these balloons and where this threat is coming from. Israel has troops all down there, and Hamas is, uh, is lining up some troops there as well, and that's where the big danger is. Again, just happened a few hours ago. So this is really, really big. We're going to get into why. Uh, again, well, we will touch on some of this tonight, but just there's like, like I said, it's so difficult because as I'm saying, there's just like 85 different things popping into my head. And if I start chasing those rabbit trails, we're going to be here until the Lord does come back. So I'm going to try to keep... Keep on track, but it's, it's very, very difficult. All right, so let's take a look at something here. Now, this is the passage in, um, in our Bibles. Now, this is very interesting. And in my studies, and I know that those of you who have been in particular in the Wednesday group, but I've even talked about it on Sunday morning, the idea of the Lord's name, okay? Now, we always see the word Lord and stuff, and I think that pretty much everybody knows that when we see the English word Lord with all capitals, okay, it's translating the Hebrew, uh, uh, the Hebrew word Yehovah, which we get Jehovah from. Okay, it's not Jehovah. Don't let anyone tell you. There's nothing wrong with saying Jehovah. I'm not saying that. But that's not how it was pronounced because there was no J sound in any language until the 8th century, so about 1,200 years ago. No language on this planet had a J sound. Think of Spanish. It's why they don't say Jesus or they say Jesus. It's why they don't say Josie. They say Jose. Okay? There was no J sound. It didn't exist. So Jehovah, though it's okay, it, and yet there's certainly nothing wrong with it, but properly, because there was no J sound, and the J sounds typically came in with what we now call a Y, so that's why Jehovah is probably more accurate, as far as we understand. Now, that's easy to understand, but this name, okay, is so significant in particular in the passages that we're going to look at, that we're going to look at it in what the translation, that's a little bit of a challenge to read, but we're together and so we'll kind of walk our way through it. And the scriptures are a translation that was taken directly from Hebrew and translated into English. And so it maintains uh, the Hebrew names in Hebrew letters. We're going to be talking about that, so don't worry about it. Now, why is that all important? Uh, because when we go through the passages we're going to look at, Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39, uh, Psalm 83, uh, here in Amos chapter 3, we're going to see, you're going to find out that as God is speaking, that he is not dealing with the nations per se, in, except in the sense that they are puppets. What God is doing is speaking to the supernatural realm because that's where the problem is. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's great prayer as the, the Israelites are coming to the end of the 70-year captivity in Babylon. They were taken there by King Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of the 70 years that they were supposed to be in Babylon, Daniel reads the book of Jeremiah. And he realizes we're at the end of the 70 years. This prompts him to pray. So Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9 is just incredible if you read it, okay? Um, but what ends up happening is that you get towards the latter part of that chapter and God, as Daniel is praying, dispatches the angel, the Malachi, uh, which is a messenger, okay, not this winged thing that we think, 
They don't have to have wings, though, because we read cherubim have wings and the seraphim and all this. We think that all angels do. We don't know if they do. There's nothing that indicates they do. They're messengers from God. That's what they do. They carry his message. That's what the word malachi or malachim in the plural and, and angelos in the Greek, right? It means messenger. But when we hear angel, we think dudes flying around, right? Like John Travolta. He liked, uh, you know, he liked cookies because he was, uh, he was Michael, not Gabriel. Well, God dispatches his messenger, the angel Gabriel. I was going to put these verses here, but you'll see why. It's like if I do that, we're never going to get beyond it. But God sends Gabriel to give Daniel a message. And Gabriel makes an incredible statement that oftentimes we miss. Gabriel says to Daniel, when you began your prayer, God sent me to speak to you, but I was withheld. In other words, I was kept away for three weeks by the prince, supernatural realm, the, the ruler, the spiritual ruler over Persia. He resisted me. He was trying to keep me from delivering this message. So you've got this supernatural thing that's going on. Now, don't think Twilight Zone. We could go through the entirety of Scripture. We've done so on our Wednesday nights, um, and it is very clear. We don't like the idea of it because, you know, we, as I said, we're into the Twilight Zone or the outer limits. But the Scripture is very, very clear. Besides, for the religious of Jesus' day, who did he have the biggest problem with? The supernatural realm. We know who you are, son of the Most High God. Did you come to torment us before it's time? Right? We just blow that off. Oh, well, that happened 2,000 years ago. It's going to happen today. You better think again. It happens today all the time. We're just oblivious to it because we don't think so. Anyway, so Gabriel finally gets to Daniel after being held up by this prince of Persia. Now keep that in mind because next week we're going to look at Ezekiel 38. And we're going to see another guy who is called Prince there. And you're going to see, I'm going to show you that I believe that this is not a human being. It's a spiritual being because he's going to show up again in Revelation. His name is Gog. Okay? Anyway, so when we understand this name concept and we keep seeing it in the passages we're clearly going to look at, but through the rest of the scripture as a whole, God is constantly, in particular in the Old, in the Old Testament, he's constantly reminding people about his name, right? He told uh, when Moses stood before him at the burning bush, and he said, I want you to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And Moses had been 40 years in Egypt to worship the sun and the moon and the stars and the Nile and the dirt and the flies and the cows and, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. And Moses says, oh, that's great. So when I go to tell them, this God sent me, as far as they know, you're just one of another group of gods. So who do I tell them sent me? Which one are you? Are you Ra? Are you Isis? You know, are you Hafet? Whatever you are. Which one are you? And then the Lord does this amazing thing. You can read this in Genesis chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 3. And he said, Ashir eye asher. I am that I am. That's who you tell them sent you. Now, what most people miss is verse 50. We all know about the I am that I am. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean a lot to you and I, but to Moses and to the rest of the, the spiritual realm, he just said, I am the only one who is self-existent. All others are created. Because that's what, uh, and, and that the abbreviation of is, is Yehovah. That's how we come up with the word Yehovah. We won't get into all of that stuff because that's phenomenal when you understand what's happening there. No time for that. Here I go down another rabbit trail, right? But anyway, but the point is that God is sending him with his name that w at, against what we think are 10 plagues of Egypt. They are not plagues on Egypt. They are judgments on Egypt's gods. 
The God of the Nile, the God of the sun, the God of death, right? The God of the cows, the God of the frogs, the God of the flies, all of the gods. These are Mo Moses is sent with a message from the great I am to show Egypt that your gods, now, they're really not gods. They're wannabes. That's what that's all about. So you see over and over again the significance of God saying my name. In 315 of Exodus, he said, this is my Shem, which means name. This is my name forever. Throughout your generations, I am to be known as Yehovah. This is my name and the remembrance of who I am every time you speak it. And then you go through the rest of the scripture and over and over again, right? And we see, you tell them in the name of the Lord. You tell them, you know, speak against the gods of the nations and the name of the Lord. No, 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 no. It's not the name of the Lord. It's the name Yehovah. The reason it's establishing who he is against all of the other gods, it clearly identifies him. So why did they change? Well, because the law came along, and the, one of the commandments, one of the mitzvah, one of the, the signposts, the directives, said, you will not take my what? My name in vain. <gasps> we can't say his name. So we're going to substitute Lord. But that's not what the verse means, and that's not what it says. What he means by using his name in vain is to equate his name with the rest of these false, fake gods, the wannabes. Do not use my name and equate my name with the gods of the nations. Read Psalm 85. Okay? So his name is to be holy. So now that you understand that, that's going to become huge for where we're going to go tonight and into next week. Now look at this verse. This is the King, New King James Version. Surely the Lord God oh, does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now secrets doesn't mean... Okay? That's how we understand it. What it means is he's telling them something that they don't know. That's what's happening. That's what the word secret means. He's explaining to them what's going to happen because they don't know. So don't think of secret as God's just going, you know, listen, angels, Gabriel and Michael, I got this thing. Just it's got to stay between us. It can't leave this room, right? That's how we view secret. That's not what it means. So he's going to reveal what he's going to do to who? The prophets. And who are they? They're servants. And remember the word prophet does not mean proclaiming the future. Much of what God was going to tell them would concern the future. But... A prophet was one that proclaims the message of God. If it has to do with the future, so be it. If it has to do with today, so be it. What is the, the, the key distinction which everybody loses with the idea of a prophet? What was the major statement, anybody, what was the major statement that we read over and over and over again in the Old Testament when the prophet spoke? What's the phrase? Anybody know? I know it's kind of hard. I just threw this out there. Thus saith the Lord. That's the duty of the prophet. To proclaim what God has told him. If it has to do with the future, then so be it. Now, here's the thing. Surely the Lord God, right? Now, this is really interesting. And one of those things that I have to be careful because I get highly irritated over this as you can probably tell, because if they had just translated correctly, we would not have the issues that we have today. 
Why do the English translations not say Yehovah? Well, they do if you read the scriptures and a few of the others. But by far, most of them will not say Yehovah. They say Lord. Spanish people don't call him that. They call him Jehovah. Well, Jehovah, Jehovah, I think it's, I don't even know Spanish speakers. Is it Jehovah? Is that how you say it? Huh? Jehovah. Okay, there you go. See? But we're so sure in English that Lord has to be correct. Well, the rest of the world says it right. We're the ones that got it figured out. Lord is really okay. Well, then why does everybody else say Jehovah? You see, do you see the arrogance of the West? It never ceases to amaze me. So let's take a look at this a little bit closer. Here is that same verse. This is what you call, don't get wrapped around the axle here. This is what you call a transliteration. This is taking the English word or phrase, okay? And then you see in the little brackets, that is the English translation of the Hebrew word, okay? So here it is, surely the Lord, Adonai, that's how you say that, God, now you would think, and we'll see this here in a minute, what is God, how does anybody know how God is normally translated? When we see the English word God, what's the Hebrew word behind it? Anybody? Huh? El, well, Elohim, because it's, it's speaking of the plural nature, okay? So, God, here's what the Hebrew looks like, okay, that says Elohim, remember you're reading right to left, Okay, what does Elo, uh, and that's how you pronounce it. So you would think, surely the Lord, Adonai, the Lord God, Elohim, will do asa, nothing, davar, but he revealeth, of course this is translated from the King James, gala, his secret, kaud, is how you would say that, unto his servants, eved, the prophets, the navi. The prophets were called navi, okay, plural, nabiim. Single prophet is a nabi, prophets is nabiim. This is showing you the root, so don't get confused in that. So that should be translated, because after all, doesn't the English say, there's surely the Lord God? Oh, you would think God is translating Elohim then, is it? No, 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 no. What the crud is going on here? It does not say Lord God. It says Lord Adonai. I mean, so, I'm sorry, Adonai Yehovah. If the word is Elohim that we get God from, why did you translate it, or, or if, uh, uh, Yehovah, why did you translate it as God? Do you see? Now, this is important because these passages we're going to see as we look get into this over and over and over again, we're going to see the phrase master and then the Hebrew Yehovah because Adonai is Lord or master. They mean the same thing. They use master because in the passage where it's put here, it's, you, he's clearly in control, okay? He's the master of the plan. It's not just Lord, there's nothing wrong with that, but he's master. You're gonna see that. So there was a direct, uh, a direct, I don't wanna say mistranslation, but but I want, but there's a clear change here. Everywhere else, God shows up in the English, it's Elohim. Everywhere. And everywhere else that Yehovah shows up, it's Lord, all capitals. But not here. And not in the passages over and over again that we're going to take a look at. Now this is, I know this is bizarre. Don't get, again, don't get wrapped around the axle. Why did they do that? Because if they translated it, now look at Amos 3.7 at the top. If they translated it in the same way that they translated it everywhere else, surely the Lord, Lord does nothing. Well, we can't say Lord, Lord. So we're going to change the word to God, even though we know that it doesn't mean God. Do we not see a problem with that? That's horrible. How would you like something that you said be translated into something else and somebody said, well, I know that that's what you meant, but this is what we're going to say. No, no, that's not, that's not that completely changes what I'm trying to, yeah, yeah, we know, but you know, people will get confused, so, you know, and we don't want to offend you, so we're gonna go ahead and change this. Nobody would allow that, but we have the translators doing it, at least, most translators, not all, okay? So, 
Here's what it really looks like. Here's the scriptures translated directly from the, the Hebrew scriptures. For the master, Yehovah, that's how you say it, remember, reading from right to left in that funny looking letters there, that's yod He vav He. okay? So for the master, Adonai, Lord or master, either one, for the master, Yehovah, does no matter in other words, he does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants. And that's what that Hebrew verse says right there. You see the two words in green, or green, shoot, in yellow? That first one with starting with the X, that's the Hebrew Aleph. And it says, Adonai Yehovah. So how the crud can anybody translate Yehovah into God? Not only how can they, why would they? Do you see the point? Now, the reason this is significant, that phrase, master, which is Adonai, Yehovah, it's the name, they're focused on the name, master, Adonai, is not a name. It's a title. Okay? So Adonai is not a name. Remember what God said? This is my name, and I want it remembered forever. And every time you say my name, then you will remember me. Well, we're not going to say your name, Lord, so we're going to start calling you, uh, we're going to call you Lord, but that's not my name. Well, we don't want to offend you, so we're going to call you Lord. But that's not my name. You see? Right? You, I mean, this is obvious. This is establishing where we're going because we're going to see the significance of this name and the fact that he's in control of his plan as Adonai, as master, okay? So in these two words, okay, that is the word Yehovah. I could totally get into this. Again, this is such a challenge because that yod He vav He. oh my gosh, those letters, what they literally say, is just, just incredible. Behold the divine hand, behold the nail. That's what the name means. Behold the hand, behold the nail. That's what those letters mean. Whoa, where have we heard that before? Thomas, behold my hands, behold the nails and my feet. He was saying, I'm Yehovah. I'm the yod heh vav -He. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. I am that I am. I am the existent one, the one that you should remember every time you speak my name. Not insert a substitute, but every time you say the name. So this is incredible. We, you know, I, we just don't have time to develop all this, okay? Then that word before it is the word Adonai, okay? That's how you pronounce it. The, the letters are the actual things, the little dots and squiggles and stuff. Those are the vowels, okay? I won't bore you with all of that. Um, but that's pronounced Adonai, okay? And it means Lord or Master. In the scriptures, they're using Master because we're going to clearly see that Yehovah is the master behind the plan and the purpose that we're going to be looking at, all right? So that's why they chose master. It would work with Lord, but the idea of master is just that he's master. He's the master. He's the one that's directing it. Who's the one directing it? Yehovah, okay? That's who's directing it, okay? Now, so what's the big deal about this? Well, why is this a big deal, Rick? Who cares? Well, we're going to see in the passages that we're going to look at that in Amos chapter 3, that phrase, okay, Master Yehovah or Adonai Yehovah, if you use the Hebrew, that it's four times in one chapter. Now, folks, when things are said one time in the scripture, they're pretty important. When they're said repeatedly, they're really important, okay? Where we're headed in just a few minutes in Ezekiel 36, 17 times. You don't see it in your English. Your English says Lord God. So you think, because we've been told, that if you know, you're reading Jehovah or Yehovah Elohim, but you're not. You're reading Adonai Yehovah. Do you see? 
Now, I'm not saying this was intentional. I don't know. I just think that it's, it's just, look, at, if you're going to translate a language, you don't get to, you don't get to mess with it. Red means red. You don't get to translate red into another language and call it purple. It's red. You don't get to take the name Rick and translate it as Steve. You don't get to do that. Nobody at any time in the world history would ever do this. But we see it all the time in our scripture and most of us are oblivious to it. But 17 times what you read as Lord God in Ezekiel chapter 36 isn't Lord God at all. It's Adonai Yehovah, Master Yehovah, Master I am, okay? Well, that's not, a, what about 37? Six times where we're headed later. Whoops. 38, another six times. So this phrase is obviously very, very important. All right. So let's take a look at this now. Oops, I'm sorry. And then in verse 39, chapter 39, sorry, nine times. Okay. Now, here's the rest are parts of this. Now, look, guys, we simply cannot go through all of this. And unless, like I said, unless we still want to be sitting here when Jesus returns. We just can't. So I had to go through these passages, and it, it's pain, and I mean painful for me to pull little bits out of this thing to try to explain this. Because it makes me feel like I'm trying to manipulate it. I'm not. I'm trying to give us the clearest picture. So having said that God, that that the master, Yehovah, isn't going to do anything that he doesn't let, that, that he doesn't tell his prophets, his ministers. Verse 7, now look at verse 8. A lion has roared. Now, this is the, the scripture's translation. It's going to be very different than your King James, your New King James, your NIV, whatever, okay? It's just another translation. It's not very, this one I think came out in 2009. Uh, there are even ones that are newer and stuff. And of course, for years, we would only read the King James. And then, well, we can read the King James, the New King James, and then all the others came along. Well, now you understand why people have problems with these translations, whether it's the King James or not. They don't translate correctly. Whatever their purpose, I'm not knocking them. I mean, they did what they did, and thank God for that. Don't know. But we do know now the proper translation. So why aren't we translating it correctly? I know when you see something that, hey, we can correct this. Shouldn't we correct it? Anyway, so... So this is going to, it reads a little cumbersome, but you'll see, and I'll try to point out places because you don't know, uh, it's difficult to, um, uh, you know, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with these names to know what's going on here, but you're going to start to see a pattern. A lion has roared. Who is not afraid? The master, Yehovah, has spoken. Who would not prophesy? Who would not proclaim what, I don't know, what Yehovah is speaking? Cry out at the palaces in Ashdod. Okay, Ashdod, Syria, you know, it's all Middle East, okay, you get the idea. And at the palaces in the land of Mitzrayim, anybody know what Mitzrayim is? Egypt. It's Egypt, that's what Egypt's name is. We're going to be looking at that in Genesis 10, uh, probably next week. And say, gather on what? The mountains. Oh, didn't we say, watch the mountains? Do you know what mountains these are? Gather on the mountains of Shomeron. We call it Samaria. Remember, what section of Israel's blocking sat in the area of Samaria? The West Bank. Oh, now this is Amos. This is 700, 700 years before Jesus. God, it sounded like he watched the same program I just watched today. You see, it's because God was saying, this is the things that are going to happen. So gather on the mountains and see the many us unrest in her midst. Would you say that the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank are at unrest? Uh, yeah. In her midst, and the oppressed ones with her. But they do not know to do what is right, declares, and this is simply Yehovah, 
You would see it as Lord in your Bible. And uh, do what is right, declares Yehovah, those who store up plunder and loot in their palaces. This is just a description of how bad things are in this area. Therefore, thus said Master Yehovah, an enemy even all around the land. What land? My land, we're going to see. God is going to clearly say, it's my land. Well, you say it's Israel's land. It is, but they only have it because it belongs to God. That's why I keep telling you. I don't care what the American government says or the Russian government or the Israeli government or any other government in the world about whose land that is. It belongs to God. And he gave it to Israel as a blessing to the nations because all nations are invited to that land. Why do you think so many people flock to Israel every year on tourism? So that's what's being described here. Therefore, thus said, Master Yehovah, an enemy, even all around the land. What did we just look at? The Gaza Strip in the south, Egypt, right? Right on the border of Israel. The West Bank, right along the border of Israel, right? With Lebanon, Hamas, we're going to see also uh, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad. All of these are in there right on the border of Israel. Then you go up and there's a portion of Syria that borders Israel. And then to the west of Syria, but still on the north, is Lebanon. Gee, almost sounds like, like uh, uh, when the Lord told this to Amos that it sounded like he was reading or watching the news in 2020. Because these are the nations that surround Israel. Were they nations in Amos' day? No, they were not. They were not. So what he's telling them is for the last days. And that's what this is. So notice what's happened. An enemy, even all around the land. And he shall bring down your strength from you. And your palaces, uh, palaces shall be plundered. Now let me make one more statement. Amos wrote just before the Assyrians came in and took the 10 northern tribes. So when you read Amos, which is not uncommon in the scripture, there's an immediate or a, or a present issue that's happening, okay, because they're about to be taken by the Assyrian empire, but it goes beyond that. How do we know? Look at what we just said, and all around the land, see? The Assyrians didn't circle Israel, but they do now. Or the enemy, Stone Israel. So you see, so there was a, a present fulfillment of God's words, but there was clearly a future that looks down. Okay? And when you read these things and you understand this, you, can, you start to identify these things. Verse 12, thus said Yehovah, as a shepherd rescues from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, because a lion has demolished the lamb, so are the children of Yitzrael, is how they say it, who dwell in Shamaron, in Samaria, to be rescued. God's going to rescue his people. Not America, not even the Jews themselves, but God. Wait till we get to 36 and watch what happens. In the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch. In other words, the people that live in Samaria are so beaten down that they're hiding in the corner and they're sitting in the corner of the couch to protect themselves. That's the fear that they have. God says, I'm coming to get you. Hear and witness against the house of Yaakov. That's the house of Jacob. In other words, Israel. This in particular, the 10 northern tribes, declares the master, Yehovah, the Elohim. Ah, there's our word, God. So notice what you have. Remove the word the, you have Adonai, you have Yehovah, and you have Elohim. All three Hebrew words describing him. Why didn't they do that here? Because they couldn't. You just, you wouldn't make sense to read it. Well, these guys didn't. See the point? Again, we got to stop this stuff. Verse 14, for in the day I visit Yisrael or Israel, for why? For their transgressions. I shall also punish concerning the slaughter places of Beth El, Beth El, 
okay, the house of God, and the horns of the slaughter place shall be broken, and they shall fall to the ground. What's being described here? God says, when I come in to rescue these lambs, I'm going to sit in judgment of your religion, the house of God, Bethel. I'm going to sit in judgment of it. You bring these sacrifices, they mean nothing to me. You do all of these observa observations, they mean nothing to me. I will destroy them. Because you're more about the temple and its sacrificial system and its ordinances than you are about the one that the temple is supposed to represent, me. You've become sidetracked. You're putting your trust in the things that don't matter. Holy cow, I'm never going to get through this. Ay. So, so I'm going to break down your false, fake religion that doesn't care for anyone else. And I shall strike the winter house along with the summer house. Oh, they had snowbirds in Israel. <laughs> Apparently. Because you see, not only is he going to set a judgment against the religious, he's going to set a judgment against the rich. The haves versus the have-nots, those cowering in the couch, in the corner. There's a quite the difference. God says, I'm bringing judgment. Because this is happening because of you, the religious. But we're more about your traditions than about my teachings, my Torah. You lead no one to me. You lead them to you. That's exactly what Jesus is going to say in Matthew. And what he's already begun to say in Matthew. Okay? So, but I shall strike the winter house along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall be swept away, declares Yehovah. Well, I had anticipated <laughs> getting all of that, plus Ezekiel 36 and 37 in tonight. We're not going to make it. So uh, we're going to have to stop there because there's a ton coming up here. But at least I hope, whatever the time frame is, I hope you understand the significance of what's happening here. Because what God is saying in these passages, we know he's already told his prophets, none of the stuff happening over there should surprise us today. None of it. We know what's going to happen. People will call us crazy. They will call us dreamers. They will call us lunatics. They will call us foolish. They will call us whatever adjective seems to fit. But make no mistake about it. What you're watching happen, if you're watching, has already been told by God. And where we are headed very shortly is what Ezekiel describes as what we call a northern conspiracy that will come against Israel. We just watched it line up closer than it's ever been. I made mention of it Sunday morning when Turkey made a covenant with Libya which Greece and Egypt, uh, uh, um, yeah, Greece and Egypt responded with their own covenant. What just happened a few days ago? What was another covenant? Anybody know? Who did Israel make a final agreement? Never happened in world history. Anybody know? The UAE, United Arab Emirates. Uh oh! All of a sudden, somebody in the Persian Gulf, the UAE, is at peace with Israel. And they have opened tourism to Israel. Did you see that? Well, how do you get from Israel, if you've got hostile Iran, Iraq, and all of these other places in between, how do you get from Israel over to Abu Dhabi or uh, Dubai? How do you get over there? Well, you have to fly over Saudi Arabia. Guess what Saudi Arabia just did? The ancient, one of the ancient enemies of Israel. Yes, you can fly in our airspace. And we now know that with probably within the next couple of weeks, there will be an agreement made not just with the UAE, but with, with Oman, with Qatar, uh, Bahrain, all of those places. Why is that significant? Because Ezekiel tells us when this confederacy marches on Israel, that Egypt is not involved, Saudi Arabia is not involved, the UAE is not involved. 
Oman, Bahrain, none of them are involved. All of the players that are going to be missing from Ezekiel 38 have either already or are about to sign an agreement with Israel. So my challenge to you this week, read Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, and 39. You're going to see bizarre names there. Son of man, set your face against Gog, the chief prince, and you will read chief prince of Rosh, which people say it's Russia. Ay. Rosh means head. It's not a place. He's the chief prince who is the head of the land of Magog. Right? Speak to him because I'm going to cause him to come down onto Israel and he's going to bring Persia with us. He's going to bring uh, uh, Togarma. He's going to bring Meshach Tubal. He's going to read, bring Fut. He's going to bring uh, Kush. He's going to bring all of these weird things and you're going to read those names and go, what the crud? What the crud is today's news. Never happened in history. Never. This is just, I cannot tell you how stunning this is. Based on Bible prophecy, it is stunning. And we're watching it unfold. So read those passages. We'll define all of that stuff next week and look at those names. Um, you already saw one, Mitzrayim is Egypt. Uh, we've already seen that, so that should give you a hint. God does not look at the world, never has, never will, the way that we look at it. We see nations. God never sees nations. He sees people. Descendants of people. And all those names you will find in Genesis chapter 10 as descendants of Yahweh, Japheth, from which all of the European nations come from. Well, wait a minute. You said Persia. That's Iran. They're Arab. Do not tell a Persian he's Arab. They will shoot you. Do not tell an Arab he's a Persian. He will shoot you. They are not Arab. Sound interesting? Why do you think Iran with the, the whole super race and, and got into a thing with, uh, with Hitler over the pure race, the Aryan race? Where did, you, where did all that originate? Iran. How could that be if they're Arab? Ah, World history starts to make a little more sense when you look at it from God's perspective. So, so do that. Look into that stuff. We'll get into this next week. Sorry, I didn't move faster. But it, like I said, it's so difficult. So see you next week, same time. All right, let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. Because our opinions, our interpretations, our whatever for your word are absolutely irrelevant. Your word is just that, your word. And we do the best we can to understand it. But Lord, we need you to reveal it just like you did to your servants, the prophets. You have shown us what you were going to do and we are watching it unfold as we speak. This is the significance for the Christian, not what the media is trying to sell us. We are so easily distracted from that which is important because that which we're talking about here is about eternity. That's the significance. When we get caught up and worried and afraid of the temporal, your heart, your perspective is for the eternal. And so, Lord, thank you for your word, for its consistency. It doesn't allow anybody to change it. Even though many have tried, it doesn't work. So thanks again for bringing us here. Take us home safely, Lord, and bring us back together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great night.